Unit 42, Response to Basic Emergencies. So dealing with emergencies. So emergency situations develop rapidly and unpredictably. So you're going to you know, often happen upon an emergency. It's an unexpected situation that requires immediate action and medical attention. And what's really important with an emergency is that you as a healthcare provider remain calm. So in a true emergency, prompt action is needed to either prevent further complications or save the life of a victim, just depending on what the, the circumstances are. Uh, it's important to take immediate action, but it's also very, very important that we are uh, calm and making sure that we're not creating more victims when we respond to an emergency. So you're not going to respond to an emergency if the situation is unsafe. So when you're working in a hospital or a long-term care facility, you're going to have skilled nursing care around. You're going to have other professional medical help, doctors um, available to help you in an emergency. Excuse me, sorry. So you're, when you're witnessing an accident, so you happen upon um, a car accident, you're going to be away from a medical facility, and you may not have access to professional help. So uh, you know ultimately, the decisions you make and how you respond are going to be slightly different. So whatever the course of action that is chosen, the victim should not be further endangered. So again, we're going to take a step in we, when you first respond to an emergency and make sure, is the environment safe? Is it safe for me to even enter and respond? And then whatever decisions I make for this um, course of action, I want to make sure I'm not further harming the victim. So again, if someone, a great example of this is if someone has a potential for a spinal cord injury, that you're not going to want to be moving the patient um, to further endanger them. We want to make sure that we're keeping them as safe and um, healthy as we possibly can. So the ABCs, so in any emergency, the ABCs are always the primary concern. And I know now in CPR they're teaching CAB uh, and sorry, at CAB, but in, in nursing, it's still always airway, breathing, circulation, okay? So, b but really important though here is that you're, these are always going to be your primary concern. Don't get distracted by other things going on. Airway, breathing, circulation are always going to be the most important response. So do not become distracted by other conditions, for example, bleeding. So if someone's um, not breathing, someone doesn't have an airway, we're going to be more concerned about that than the bleeding. So again, we're going to, we're going to follow up on the bleeding later, but the most concerning thing is always going to be airway, breathing, circulation in that order. Okay. So you're always going to evaluate and stabilize the ABCs before caring for other problems. So making sure that the airway is clear, the person's breathing appropriately, there's no circulatory concerns, and then we're going to care for what else is going on once we get through evaluating and stabilizing the ABCs. So resuscitation, so essentially the definition of resuscitation uh, is saving. So it's necessary in emergencies when the breathe, when breathing stops or the heart stops beating. So you either have apnea um, or arrest, you know, cardiac arrest. So it's most successful if it's performed immediately. So again, time is of the essence. You want to make sure that once you have um, realized that the, the environment's st safe, that you can act upon this emergency, that you're going to perform actions as soon as possible because time is very important. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So all of you in this class have already had CPR. So cardio meaning heart, pulmonary meaning lungs, and resuscitation meaning saving. So again, what we're really concerned about is saving those vital organs and, you know, cardiopulmonary uh, saving. So during CPR, the heart is squeezed between the sternum in the front and the spine. And basically what that's going to do is help move uh, some of blood flow through the body. So the chest compressions provide approximately one quarter to one third of normal blood flow, which is pretty amazing actually, just providing those chest compressions. And that is sufficient to sustain life in the short term. So again, we're always um, you know, calling for medical help to come as well, but that can sustain life in the short term um, by providing that one quarter to one third of normal blood flow. So Red Rocks Community College offers CPR classes, um, and again, it's a CPR, it's a prerequisite course for all nurse aid courses. So it's HPR 102, and it's a half credit class. So um, it, it, this is a requirement of this class, and it's a requirement for any other healthcare course that you're going to take here at Red Rocks. 
So protecting the airway is very important. Airway is the structure through which air enters and leaves the body. So airway, you want to make sure that you have a clear airway so the person is able to breathe. So air passage must be open to take in oxygen, and then it also is going to remove waste products, uh, the carbon dioxide. So the lower, lower airway extends from the back of the throat into the lungs, and that goes all the way out into the alveoli, which is going to actually be uh, the part of the lungs that's going to work with the bloodstream to um, you know, move oxygen into the bloodstream and take waste products away. So the patient may be unable to breathe if there's a blockage in the lower airway. So if something's blocking the lower airway, they're not going to be able to breathe and get that good um, oxygen flow to the cells where they need it. So the tongue falling into the back of the throat is one of the most common causes of airway obstruction. So um, someone passes out and their tongue falls into the back of the throat, causing um, an airway obstruction. So this commonly occurs during unconsciousness. Uh, potentially it could also be food or other foreign objects. So someone may be choking, and that choking completely occludes the airway, and then they go unconscious, and so that, that can also potentially block the airway. So maintaining the patient's breathing. So respiratory failure occurs when breathing is insufficient to sustain life. So it's not getting the, as much oxygen as the body needs, and it's not getting rid of the waste products, that carbon dioxide that it needs to breathe out. So respiratory arrest occurs when breathing stops. Um, so arrest means complete stop. So respiratory arrest, so breathing completely stops. And then abnormal respirations are often a warning of impending crisis crisis. So what will often happen with people is they'll, you'll notice a change in their breathing before the breathing completely stops. So they, they'll have, um, you know, they'll maybe be breathing less frequently, they may be breathing more shallow, but ultimately they're going to have an abnormal change in the breathing and then ultimately the breathing is going to completely stop. So the head tilt chin lift maneuver, this is the most common method of opening the airway. So this is what you learned in CPR, um, exactly like it sounds, you're going to lift the head back, um, tilt the head back and lift the chin forward, opening the airway. So the jaw thrust maneuver, this is used to open the airway of patients with known or suspected neck injuries. So again, if we don't know if there's a, a neck injury, if we suspect there may be some involvement um, with the spine or neck, we're going to make sure we use the jaw thrust maneuver also learned in CPR where you're going to move that jaw forward and open up the airway that way but not altering the the neck um, and the spine. So after the airway is open it may be necessary to insert an oral airway or suction and so again when that emergency team responds or if you're in a healthcare facility that may be at that point an oral airway or suction need. So choking, so if witnessing the universal distress sign, so again, that's the, the two hands around the neck, ask the patient if he or she can speak. And this is really important. If the patient can still speak or if the patient's coughing, they still have a partial airway, okay? So at that point, we're going to continue to, we're going to continue to encourage them to cough up whatever is you know, partially obstructing their airway. If they completely aren't able to speak or they're not making any noise, we know then that there's a complete obstruction that airway is completely closed. So um, if that's the case, if, if they can speak, you're going to remain in the room and call for help using the call signal, or if your facility's policies vary from that, you're going to follow your facility's policies. If no, you must act quickly by performing obstructed airway procedure. So if they're not able to talk, if they're not able to cough, that means that the airway is completely obstructed. Okay, so mouth-to-mask -mouth resuscitation. So mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation, this is a technique of breathing for the patient. This is when we're giving those rescue breaths. Um, and there's various adjunctive devices used to prevent mouth contact with the patient. So it's a secondary advice, device excuse me, used to maintain respiration, so you're not having to put your mouth directly on the patient's mouth. So it's just another device that's going to help you give those respirations um, to the patient, those rescue breaths. So CPR is cardiac arrest, so it's a condition in which the heart stops beating. So again, arrest, just like a resp respiratory arrest, it means stop. So cardiac stopping. Um, the CPR is used as a life-saving measure, so it should be started immediately. And this is really important. A lot of times in an emergency, people get nervous about doing the wrong thing. It's really just important to act. And even if all you're doing is compressions, you're just starting the, the procedure, making sure that you're doing something, you know.
people tend to panic in an emergency situation but even going in and attempting to give compressions and doing you know your best as you can for that person so again starting immediately making sure once the scene is safe that you start compressions immediately um, but if the time of the cardiac arrest is unknown give the patient the benefit of the doubt and begin CPR. So again, the person could have been there for a while and it, it may not be a life-saving measure at that point, but we have, to, we have to always give the benefit of the doubt and start CPR because there is the potential that we could save their life. So to be effective, the patient's upper torso must be on a firm surface. So again, remember, it's the, the compressions are pushing, um, squeezing the heart between the sternum and the spine. And so it's very important that you have a hard surface so you're able to actually squeeze the heart between that. If you have a soft surface, you're not getting those good compressions. So healthcare facilities have emergency backboards for this purpose, so they can use the backboard to provide that hard surface so you're getting effective compressions. Many low air loss beds have a valve that quickly deflates, so you see here on the left, um, if there's a code, you pull this, and basically it takes all the air out of the bed, so you then have a firm surface on which to perform CPR. So standard precautions, so again, we've talked about this in a previous unit, used to be referred to as universal precautions. It's important that, again, you keep yourself safe. So emergencies are stressful. It's really easy to become distracted and to just jump in and, and do something that can put you in um, potential risk. So you always want to protect yourself from exposure to blood, bodily fluids, secretions, excretions, mucous membranes, and non-intact skin. So again, these standard precautions, we're going to assume that these fluids, these coming in contact with these things are going to be um, infectious, and so we always assume they're infectious until we, you know, know otherwise. Uh, regardless, we're going to be using the same standard precautions. So assuming all these things are infectious, and so we have to protect ourselves from exposure. So if accidental contact occurs, which happens, you're going to wash the exposed skin area well with soap and water. If it's the mucous membrane uh, contact occurs, you're going to rinse thoroughly with running water. So if you get this in your mucus, if you get exposure in your mucous membrane, and then you're going to let your uh, supervisor know of the exposure as soon as the emergency is over. So again, as a student, your supervisor is always going to be your nursing clinical instructor. When you are start your job and you work as a CNA, it's always going to be the nurse that you're working under. So basic emergencies, there's many, many different types of emergencies, but bleeding, um, shock, fainting, uh, heart attack, stroke, which is a brain attack, and seizures. So vomiting and aspiration. So aspiration is that um, whatever they're vomiting or anything getting into the lungs that shouldn't be there. Electric shock, burns, orthopedic injuries, so you may have a fracture, head injuries, or accidental poisoning. So code words, so healthcare facilities announce various co code words over the intercom to designate different emergencies. And that's just so there's certain words that everyone knows exactly how to respond to. So facilities are standardizing to uh, minimize confusion. So, you know, if it's going to be a code pink, generally that's going to refer to um, an infant abduction. And so that's going to, everyone's going to be alert to exactly what's going on, exactly what emergency they're facing. So make sure that whenever facility you work in, you understand the various code words that they use for different emergencies. So memorize those code words used in your own facility. There's a lot of similarities, but some facilities have different code words for different things. So, you know, it's your own responsibility to know each code. And even when we're in clinical sites as students, so when we go to Lutheran Medical Center, you need to make sure that you, um, you're aware of each code and exactly what that code means. So do not resuscitate orders. The, this is really important because we always respond to emergencies, think, you know, trying to do life-saving measures. If someone has a do not resuscitate, you do not want to go and try to resuscitate this person. They have designated themselves as someone who does not want that to happen. You're then liable if you resuscitate them and they, they have a do not resuscitate order. So you must know which patients on the unit you work have DNR orders. So these the um, these can be placed in different places. So a lot of times it'll be on the chart, as you can see here on the right hand side. It'll be, sometimes be on patients or residents' doors in different facilities. And then again, when you're working in the home, where is that designation when you're working for somebody in their home? So making sure that you know where to find this information quickly, and you know about your patients or residents or clients who is a DNR. 
So the recovery position, so there's a picture of this in your book. After the immediate emergency is over, position the patient in recovery position, which is just going to be on their side so they don't aspirate. And there's, um, you can see a picture of this in your book. So early defibrillation, so AEDs are everywhere now, and so there really is no excuse not to, to have early defibrillation. So defibrillation is a method of treatment that uses electric shock to reverse disorganized activity in the heart during cardiac arrest. So what happens with the heart a lot of times is the electrical current is, is out of whack, and so um, essentially the heart is almost quivering and it's because it's basically a disorganized electrical rhythm and so what the the defibrillator is is it shocks it to try to reverse that disorganized rhythm it's um, it's important and it's critical to survival during cardiac arrest so again we have to shock that heart back into a good normal rhythm so the heart is able to effectively pump blood to the rest of the body so really the goal is to defibrillate within three minutes in a healthcare facility. So making sure that you know where the AEDs are, you can access them in an emergency, and really three minutes is, is kind of the gold standard to make sure that we're, you know, the, the patient's going to be able to survive and have, you know, the least amount of loss of function.